Hello, everybody. We, we're this is May. Let me make sure I'm in the right mind. <laughs> uh, did everybody get their newsletter in November? Yes. Good. So we're going to start with the program. We've got Tom Fields up. There. Hello, Tom. How you doing? I'm doing great. Hi. Hi, I'm Julie, the president. We Hi, Julie. Come and visit with us. Yeah. All right. We're going to let you go first, and then we'll carry on with the rest of the meeting. Great. Good. All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for showing up tonight. I hope to keep you uh, amused and interested and that you'll get something out of all this. In fact, uh, where's Phil? Raise your hand. Are you there, Phil Hudson? There you are. Hi, Phil. Now I get a chance to see it. He's actually doing some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. I'll show some of his work in a little bit. So let me uh, share my screen here. Give me a second just to get everything all set up. And we'll go like that. Good. And uh, one or two other quick things I want to do here. Give me just a moment. Great. Good. So I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes. And um, even if you're not an astronomical imager and don't really plan to do any of the kind of science I'm going to talk about, I think you'll find that uh, what we're going to discuss tonight really can deepen your understanding of the field. Uh, you know, this is, this is a really familiar image. I thought I'd start out with the familiar. You know, these are just shock waves of enormous power creating new stars. And that we all are able to witness these in our just short uh, duration of uh, being alive is really amazing. You know, the birthplace of stars is just gorgeous, but what about all these other stars? When were they born? Where are they in their life cycle? That's really the core of understanding the objects that we all observe, whether it's visually or, uh, or you know, imaging. How do we know about these objects? Now, I'm not going to get too technical tonight. I want to pop up this screen that some of you may be familiar with. This is, you know, the H, it's called the HR diagram. And this axis here is just temperature, right? So going from cool stars to hot stars. And then this axis over on the left, if I can find my cursor, oh, there it is. How to get over there? This axis over here is temperature. And most of the stars are somewhere on this line here. For example, there's Vega, there's the sun, and so forth. This is really the core of, of the foundation of how we study and understand the stars. And a lot of us have encountered it some on, on occasion. For me, you know, a lot of things I read and then I forget them. And so it's always nice to re-familiarize my, re myself with them. But how do we get here? How do we get to knowing all this as, as a species? And that came to us, of course, by the research that's been done over hundreds of years. Now, I, I wouldn't want to be up here. In fact, I'm probably way back here, like in a little window. So, uh, but it's, it's these giants upon whose shoulders we stand who have done so much. We're going to talk a little bit about the history tonight, but mostly we're going to talk about what it is, it, what it is we can learn about the stars and how do we do that? You know, for me, I have always wanted to know more. And I, I think it's like drinking from a fire hose now, except some of the water is, is, uh, is tainted these days. We've just got so much on the web, right? So the challenge for a lot of us is to find a good, you know, gradual, a gentle slope for learning. And, uh, and I found that what I'm going to talk about tonight really did that for me. And the way it did it, uh, we'll talk about in a, in a couple minutes. But basically, we're going to look at the specter of stars and how stars change the light that's leaving them and how we can study that. They say about 80% of the research and the knowledge that we have about stars is done with spectroscopy. So I'm going to talk just real briefly about this little grating there. You can see it on the screen. It's about 200 bucks. It's less than most eyepieces. And what I'm going to do is it's just a little diffraction grating. It's got a, like a prism-like device in it. I'm going to turn on this gas tube over here, and I'm going to hold the grating up. And if I rotate it so we've got the right angle, you can see different lines in there. They're repeated. It's the same pattern repeated across you can see some gold and maybe you can see some others there. It may, there we go, there's, there's some more. So this is essentially what professionals use 
on their telescopes, a lot more sophisticated equipment with collimating lenses and all sorts of stuff. But for just 200 bucks, this is the kind of thing that we can use and learn a lot from. And so my story, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go forward, but my story is that I had done some imaging, but I wasn't much of an imager. And about 15 years ago, I realized I wanted to do a little science and I, I got a grading like this and I went out in my backyard right outside those windows there. And one night here in Seattle, um, I'm about three miles from Pike Place Market downtown. So I went out and captured some spectra. And the next morning I came in and I didn't know how to process it. I couldn't find any software that worked. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. So this little grading, this star analyzer filter can be mounted on almost any telescope, camera. You can see in the upper left there, DSLRs. So all sorts of different mounting. So that's the easy part, really. It's, it's not like focusing or anything that has these critical measurements in it. And near the end, we'll talk a little bit more just about how we make those decisions. But I wanted to start out with a sample star field. Here it is. It's in Perseus. It seems like when I was editing my show tonight, uh, for tonight, I dropped the Starfinder um, sky map field that I had to show this. But it's, it's just a field in Perseus. It's up all year round. And what do we have here? We have a bunch of dots, right? Who cares? <laughs> These are the things that get in the way when we're trying to image, you know, deeper sky objects. So, but all of these stars have a story to tell. And in the next couple of minutes, I want to look at just these three stars that tell us a little bit about how we can learn to navigate astrophysics and understand more about it. So here's the same field with one of these star analyzer gradings screwed on the front of a DSLR. So we're not talking big aperture. We're not talking, you don't need a color camera. This happens to be color, but it would work just as well or even better with a mono camera. So if we look at these spectra, like this spectrum is coming off of that star, we can see they're not continuously smooth, right? There's a little gap there and there and there. And those are fingerprints. Really briefly, we won't get into a lot of the, the chemistry, but every element has its own spectra fingerprint. And so by studying those fingerprints, we can learn so much about the stars. So to start with, if we look at this star here, it's got a bunch of uh, gaps or dimmings, and we can use that to identify the type of star it is. Now, coming back to the HR diagram, that's a super giant. It's a very cool type M star. Now, you might wonder, well, who cares whether we can see it on this chart or not? And I want to just tell a quick story here. And that is quite a few years ago, my wife was using a Garmin. It was before our phones had, had GPS. And she was down uh, in the outskirts of Seattle doing some business. And she'd gotten there with the Garmin. And she, she told me this story. She went to leave and she didn't know which way to turn when she left the strip mall <laughs> because she didn't have a map. She didn't have a mental map of how she'd gotten there. And this screen here is the same kind of mental map because educators and a theorists in learning tell us that we need a cognitive map. Most of us are visual thinkers in this field. And so to know well which quadrant a star appears in uh, is, the reason I paused is because when I'm drawing on my screen, my video freezes here, my video preview. So it was like, wait, well, hey, where's my video? But I see once I turn my drawing off, you'd think I'd know I've only done this a few hundred times. So literally. So having a cognitive map like this helps us categorize the information that we're learning from other sources. Uh, and there's Matthew. Great. So what else can we learn from this image that we're looking at right here? Let's wait till Matthew comes in. We're waiting. Uh, I guess he's here. Hi, Matthew. Welcome. There you are. So we're looking at spectra, Matthew, that we have captured with just this little diffraction grating on a small telescope. We're just looking at a particular star field. So we've now identified this as a type M star. Now, what about this one down here? It's got a very different spectrum. It doesn't have it, those gaps. It's actually got one here, but it's got this bright one right there, that bright spot. What's that about? 
Well, this is, it's a type B star, but that emission line, that bright spot is because it's got a circumstellar disk going around the star. It's cool, it's like dust and it's glowing. And that's where the E in BE stars come from. That's why that little E abbreviation. So where is this star when we look at it on the HR diagram? Well, it's a B star. So we know it's going to be, you know, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere here. So it's going to be somewhere up in here around Spica and so forth. So now we've really looked at two different quadrants here on the HR diagram. So the last one I want to look at on this mini tour is down here in the lower corner. And this star, look how different that spectrum is. It has lots of dots or emission lines. What's going on with that? Well, this is what's called a wolf ray A star. And to be honest, the first time one of our users sent me a wolf ray A star spectrum, I, I couldn't remember what it was. I had read about them. You know, I started this like a lot of us 20 or 30 years ago. I read about them, you know, a handful of times at least. But, you know, Wikipedia is our friend. So, a wolf A star is a late stage star. It's got really strong stellar winds that have dissipated some of the outer shell like you see in this image. Now remember what's going on with these stars is they're fusing through the different elements, right? Starting with hydrogen and helium and nitrogen going all the way up to iron. And believe me, that's all I know about the stellar process. I have a really broad river, but it's not very deep. I assure you that. You'll find that out during the Q&A area at the end of my talk when we do some of that. So it's really cool because the outer shell has been dissipated, we can see down towards the core of the star. So again, what I'm showing you is how when you get data, then you can do a little research. And here is, we won't read the whole page, but here is, oh, didn't want to do that. Let's uh, start that again. There we go. So look at the temperature of these stars, potentially. They're just enormously hot. So these stars, you know, they're not going to be at 30,000. They're more likely to be over here. So they're going to be up here and eventually probably becoming a white dwarf. So this is the kind of navigation I wanted to highlight. It took an appreciable amount of time I've got tonight to show you this. And this is a relatively new part of my presentation. Uh, I used this presentation when uh, I was at NEEF. We had a booth uh, last month. I don't know if any of you were there. Any of you there? Raise your hand. Nope, don't see anybody. Well, sometime if you haven't been, it's, it's a great place to go. The reason I like this is because, listen, I'm, I am a businessman. I sell a product. But really, what I'm selling you is an opportunity to learn. And I think that really addresses a core need that we look, those of you who have kids or grandkids, you see it. We're learning machines, right? But to be honest, I sort of have had this imposter complex thing going on. Like most of us, I just assume most people know a lot more about the stars we're observing and their histories and how they occur and you know where they are and in you know in the scheme of things but i found that with a little bit of learning i felt much more comfortable and that learning came as a result of having my own data in my own hands that's really my goal here is that you come away going that would be interesting cuz it would help me learn things and secondly i'd like you to say to yourself i could do that for a few hundred bucks uh because it, you know, just a quick aside, I, I, when I give in-person talks, I often have a magazine with me, or I'll ask the group even, does anybody have a sky and telescope or astronomy? And I'll ask them to go to the back and show us some, you know, gorgeous nebula or galaxy image. And, you know, then you look at the fine print, and it's, you know, 20 hours of integration time. I live in Seattle. <laughs> I'm not going to get, that's like a summer's worth of observing almost for us. So. The magazines, if we depend on the magazines to decide what might be possible, we're going to be often disappointed, right? Because, listen, I don't have the skill, the equipment, uh, the knowledge, uh, the dark sky site, anything, to, or the time to do that kind of thing. I'm glad they do. They're, of course, gorgeous images. But the reason I say that is 
I don't want you sitting here with that sort of, oh, I've been deceived before kind of thought, you know, the magazines made it look easy. Everything I'm showing you tonight, and I'll point out the exceptions, are things that were done with just a simple star analyzer grading, including galaxy spectrum. We'll see that, and Phil's got a good example we'll look at in a few minutes. Okay, so let me again just set something up here on my screen. My apologies for the delay. So that's really the introduction I wanted to share with you. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the history of what we're doing, just so we all are coming from the same place, a little bit of the science too. Sir Isaac Newton is said to be the first person to split white light into its component colors using a prism. You can also do that with a finely lined surface like a DVD or um, you know, a, a diffraction grating like this, which has a lot of fine lines on it, either transparent, not reflective like we have here. Bunsen invented the Bunsen burner to burn a sample put it through a prism and look at the results. He was a real pyromaniac and the data he captured, we'll see a little later, still serves us. This guy on the right, Kirchhoff, we won't spend much time talking about him. He was a contemporary, uh, but there's one thing that he, he talked about that will help looking at the samples I'm gonna start showing you in a few moments. And that is, he talked about the fact that there are two types of spectra. Some are a rainbow with gaps, and some are more or less dark with bright lines. Now, whether they're gaps or bright lines, they're gonna be in the same position. And what you get is beyond the scope of our discussion tonight. Uh, it has to do with the temperature of the gas that the light is going through as it leaves the star and stuff like that. So, you know, here's the cool thing about Bunsen most people don't know. And that is not only did he invent the Bunsen burner and name it, but he deliberately did not patent it. He said explicitly, I'm not patenting this because I want it available for the betterment of humanity. I mean, it's really a remarkable stand. If it would never happen today, would it? Google would have bought it or someone. So these chemical fingerprints that we've seen earlier, I just want to point out across the top there on hydrogen, those hydrogen lines, we call them the bomber lines and we actually have given them Greek names. So that hydrogen beta line there, that's if what what color is that? Let's let's call let's call that robin egg blue, okay? And we'll see where that comes up later. Of course, there's a ton of hydrogen in the universe, which is why hydrogen is of interest to us. Uh, one quick, uh, very complicated drawing, and that is this. It's a actually a poster that we we put together, and I just want to show you that the spectral lines differ from element to element type. This is uh, like I said, a full size poster. Uh, I can uh, brag for a second that Neil deGrasse Tyson told me he had one hanging on his office wall. It's a, a longer story than I have time to tell, but uh, maybe later if somebody asks about it. Okay, what do all of the astronomers have in common that we've just looked at? They're old white men. So I want to show you just a couple examples. Now, many of us have heard of Annie Jump Cannon, and you know their story is that, <coughs> excuse me, she and her women team were prohibited from the Harvard computers because of their gender. So what they ended up doing, she and her computers, as they were called, was they end up, ended up using the uh, photographic plates in order to study the spectra of stars. They, they looked at literally hundreds of thousands of these spectra. And, and really, with that much data and with the insight they had, they came up, uh, Annie Jump Cannon, with a classification scheme that we still use today, a really powerful scheme. So uh, Priyamvada Nataraja, uh, I think she's at Dartmouth and she studies uh, studies hyperactive black holes. Uh, Nancy Grace Roman, I recently heard her referred to as the mother of the Hubble telescope. You can see it in the background there. Uh, Elisa Quintana studies uh, uh, planets, exoplanets uh, around cooler uh, type M redder stars uh, looking for life perhaps. And Jedediah Eisler, uh, she's at Yale, or I may have, I may have mixed up her and Priyamvada. Uh, she's studying uh, black holes also. So this is a fun slide for me to put together some time ago, uh, just because there are so many women in the field uh, who haven't gotten due recognition. And I thought it was important that we acknowledge that. So there's all the history, theory, and equipment. What can we actually do? Well, we put a star analyzer grading right in line with our starlight in our telescope or our DSLR. And we get that thing on the bottom, right? Let's take a look at a really cool example. Put your sunglasses on because it's pretty bright. So 
each one of these things on the left is, you know, I keep losing that cursor. There it is. So each one of these things on the left is a different, is a star, different temperature. So these are all different spectra captured. Notice not a lot of hardware, you know, eight inch Newtonium with one of those older um, imaging source video cameras. So we're not talking high tech here. So what do we see that's different as we look at different temperature stars here? Quite a bit, right? I just want to point out two quick differences. Notice these wide bands on these cool type M stars. So all I know about those is that these stars are cool enough that as the light leaves the star, it goes through a molecule, titanium oxide, that's on the surface. The star is cool enough it hasn't incinerated that molecule. And if we see those bands, we know we're looking at a cooler star. Now, the other really cool thing to look at is these. See all those lines? They all, all these hotter stars have them. And they're in what color are they? Well, they're in that robin egg blue. So they're that hydrogen beta line we looked at earlier. Notice, though, that this one is darker, wider, and deeper. And that's on the type A star like Vega, for example. So just a quick review of how these things happen, how these lines occur really quick, less than 30 seconds. Remember the Bohr atom, I should start my timer, the Bohr atom model has electrons going around in shells. The shells are numbered. Sometimes an electron jumps from shell to shell. And when an electron jumps from shell two to shell four, it absorbs energy right at this wavelength, 4864. So that's how these are happening. Now, why aren't they as strong here? Because these hotter type B stars, when the electrons jump, there's so much energy there, they just jump up and maybe even all the way out. So, and what about the cooler stars down, and down here? Why don't they have a line down through there? Same reason, more or less, and that is there's not enough energy to pump them all the way up. So they might get up to shell three, but that's it, that's spectroscopy. That's all you need to know about spectroscopy, how it works, how it happens. So let's look at some other examples here. So, you know, suppose, let's just do a thought experiment here. Suppose the Hubble Space Telescope people made a huge blunder, a huge mistake, and they gave me telescope time. And I captured a spectrum and I said, you know, I think that there's an absorption feature right there, right where that crosshair is. I don't know if you can see that on your overhead. It, and it's in the robin egg blue, but you know, robin egg blue does not make science. Uh, you know, they, I'd never get published with that. So we need to become quantitative. We need to actually measure what color they are. And for that, we use a unit called angstroms or nanometers. So the way we do that is we use software to just plot the intensity of this region here, this entire sensor on our camera. So this peak, this is intensity here, this scale, our axis, is the star itself, right? Where some of the light just went right through. And this dip over here is the dip there. And if we turn off those drawings, you can actually see it. Now we can do science. We can measure where that dip is, which is what its color is, how deep it is, how wide it is, how it compares to tomorrow night, different instruments, everything. It's easy to do that science. So my story is I came in from that first night out and I wanted to get one of these graphs. I downloaded some of the freeware that was out there. This is like 2009 and it just kept crashing. You know, I don't like learning new software anyway. And it not only was it crashing, but it, it, the error messages were in French. So, you know, that, that adds insult to injury. Nothing against the French. In fact, they do more spectroscopy and in some ways better spectroscopy than any other country in the world. So I ended up, I thought, okay, next weekend. Actually, the first thing I did is I put it back in its box, this grating. And I threw it in the drawer. I gave up. I told my wife, I'm supposed to be having fun. This is a hobby. And I'm just angry, frustrated. So, but it kept bugging me. And so a few weeks later, I said to myself, you know, how hard can it be? I'm a software developer. I've been doing it for decades. I'll just write a program that does this graph. And now 
I don't know, 10 or 15,000 hours later, it's, it's almost done. My wife keeps saying, would you finish the software so that we can have dinner at a regular hour? Um, and if, I actually heard this aphorism years ago that any software that's done is out of date and archaic. So I'm always adding features, although it's getting harder and harder to find features that people need. Uh, it's Listen, I, a lot of us are gun shy, and I saw this at the Advanced Imaging Conference uh, last month, where people flew in from all over the country and paid you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars to sit through, you know, I think it was four or five lectures over two days on Pix Insight. So with my software, you don't have to sit through lectures. You know, and you'll see, in fact, I wanted to show it to you. So give me a second here. I'm just going to pop the software up. I promise this isn't going to be a software demo because there's a mic set up there on your camera and I'll hear your heads crashing as they hit the, the desks in front of you if I do too much demo. But I wanted to show you. Now, this happens to be a color camera. It need not. It could be a mono fits image or a streaming video frame. See that gap right there? And maybe some up there, maybe one in the uh, robin egg blue. So there's the star. So all we do to get that graph, that intensity graph out of this is we bracket it in with these lines. And now we've got the graph. So this peak here is the star itself. And this data, specifically that absorption feature is there. So now we're doing science. Literally, it's that easy. So, I mean, this is eye candy, this little thing here. I can turn off the color, be a little, little easier to see what the next thing is I'm going to show you. And that is, remember I mentioned that Bunsen had created a lot of data that we still use today? Well, it, that kind of data is built into the software. So we can come down here to the software and say, show me on this graph area where I should expect to see absorption or dimming if there's hydrogen involved. So look at all these lines. This line's going through a feature. This one is, this one is, this, isn't that cool? So we've now fairly compellingly identified the composition of this star includes hydrogen. This is, you can do this with like a four inch telescope. You can do it with a DSLR. Uh, you need tracking. I used to tell people, and it's true, you can do it without tracking, but it became, it's a stretch, really. You have to be a lot better than I am. I sat on my deck trying to do it, and it's just hard, you know. Stars are moving out of your field of view pretty quickly without tracking. So the only other thing to show you here, I'm just going to close this, is that this is actually a frozen frame from video, and I just want to show you that. This was I think this is an imaging source camera, but it could be one of those ZWO cameras, which if I was a good presenter, I would have had more handy. You know, it's just one of these guys. You just screw the grating right onto the nose piece. So let's take a look. I'm going to play that video. Now, this is moving a little bit. Maybe you can see it because our seeing is changing, and this is moving because of that also. So things jump around just like normal imaging, and we can turn on some stacking that's in the software and things get smoothed out pretty quickly at what, two frames per second. So this is just fantastic for any number of things. I've got a slide, it's two slides away, that's gonna talk about how you can use this in outreach. So let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation and continue on. So there's an example of my software. That's what we were just looking at, a screen capture of it. This is actually a hydrogen gas tube. There's that robin egg blue hydrogen beta line. So, um, we also, uh, for teachers, we make this little gas tube spectrometer. We uh, also develop curricula with the University of North Texas and other schools. So this is the Pleiades. It's a rather coarse spectrum. Look how grainy that is. But I wanted to show you that every star has its own spectrum and a story to tell. Now, this was done with one of those slit devices. It's got higher resolution than we'd get on, on a grating. You can see that dip that's there we might not see. Uh, with a grating uh, without a slit. But we'll talk about the slits in a few minutes. Look, look how different that one is from the others. So even our beloved Pleiades, each one has a story to tell us. So this is a slide I had hoped would come next. I, again, I did, every time I give this, I decide I'll move the slides around a little bit. So this is the kind of thing you could do at a star party, not a dark sky site, but uh, whether it's a star party, or I'll tell you, you know, a lot of us as we get older, <coughs> we um, we have more time and we want to give back. 
And of course, star parties is one way to do it. Going into a school with a telescope is pretty exciting, but you know, you probably, some of you who've tried it have seen that, seen that it's tough because just getting the kids in at night and, you know, there's a lot of lights and, you know, equipment and there's all that. But what you can do is you can use like one of these gas tubes, like this one here, along with that little classroom device. And you could, it, again, this won't appeal to all of you. It's sort of a long shot that I even bring it up, but you could get good using uh, gas tubes. And then you could go in, not to just astronomy teachers, there aren't enough of them out there, but chemistry teachers, they have to teach the spectra stuff. And this is the atoms jumping. These are the lines we see. That's my gesture. So they have to teach this. And if you can come in and give a good demonstration and then connect this to astronomy, then you're interdisciplinary. Then you say, hey, come, to, come next weekend and we're having a star party. I even wrote down the name of your observatory, Star Quest Observatory. So, and thank you all who do the uh, the outreach that you do there. It's a great name for a for an observatory. And doing outreach is one of the ways that we all do give back. Okay, let's keep moving. I wanted to show you our beloved M57. Or it may look a little different than you expect. Whoa, what are those donuts doing there? Well, M57 is not point-like, right? Visually, it's got some size. And so, with a grating like this, you actually get the object. With most extended objects, it's just going to be messy and really you're not going to get any data at all. But because there's only two wavelengths, right, hydrogen and oxygen on this object, coming from this object, we can actually see them independently there. And so, again, this is what uh, M57 is a late stage star. So, you know, we're watching it in its, in its final years or or millennia or millions of years. So what about a younger star? Now for this, I am gonna use one of those slit devices. I wanna just in passing mention, there are some, there's also a DIY uh, 3D printed version for six or $700 now available on the web and it does quite well. But still guiding and acquiring a target on a 10 micron slit, this is a big jump for any of us uh, to take as a first step. So here's our beloved M42, right? I almost said 57. So it's a stellar nursery, right? What's interesting to me is we still have our hydrogen emission line and our oxygen. But these, again, it's such an extended object that we do need to have a slit so that we can actually get good data. Um, and that usually comes uh, several years, three, four years sometimes into observing before somebody decides, you know, I've really mined this star analyzer for everything. I'm going to keep using it. And often people do because this wide view, low resolution view has a lot of interesting information in it too. So um, here's something I wanted to show you real briefly, and that's Uranus and Neptune. Here are the spectra up here, and uh, down here you can see these deep dips. Remember those that forest of lines I showed you on the type M stars? Well, these planets, of course, are quite cool too. This isn't titanium oxide, this is the methane. We are detecting on a backyard telescope with a video camera. That means in real time, that means exposures that are less than a second long, we're detecting the gas on this planet. Now, as many of us know, uh, especially with the JWST, but in the future, uh, when we, assuming, uh, detect exoplanet life, it's going to be almost definitely spectroscopic. We'll discover probably not methane, but other, uh, other things that would indicate or highly imply that there's life on the planet. How cool is it that we can actually do that ourselves now with some of our planets detect atmospheres? Okay, so in 1881, Henry Draper, he detected the spectrum of a comet. Heck, if Hank can do it, so can we. So here's the comet up here. Look at that nice little string of jewels there. And we can see the what are called the swan bands there. You'll notice, by the way, that this was captured by this guy, Vikrant Agnihotri. He's in uh, Northwest India in Rajasthan. He came to me knowing very little. Uh, I think I gave him the software, something I do now. And then I thought, poor kid in India, you know, I'll help him out. I've been to India quite a few times. And now, now he's got a paramount. <laughs> several telescopes, big telescopes. So no more free software for Vikram. He knows lots more than I do now about the science behind all this and what teacher doesn't like their student to charge past them. And he certainly did. So here's another comment, just real briefly, a little more timely, uh, Neowise. 
uh, we can see the uh, so what's called the sodium doublet. Okay, now this slide, this next slide, talk about do-it-yourselfing. Anybody who uses a C-clamp as part of their equipment setup, that's my kind of guy. This was done by Robin Leadbeater, who designed the star analyzer. And you can see the star analyzer on the nose piece or on the nose of that video camera there. See, if I used a, a, a C-clamp like this, then I'd probably, because this is what I do with hardware, I'd probably tighten it down so tight I'd destroy the camera, the enclosure would collapse. That's one of the reasons I like software, because you can always edit undo. In fact, you know, it'd be nice sometimes I've thought over the years if we had an edit undo in our lives, so we could just sort of rewind the tape a little bit or just cut a segment out. But let's look at some of uh, what Robin was able to do here. Down in the lower left, this thing here is the actual uh, spec or the actual, what is this? This is a, a meteor, excuse me. And over here is the spectrum. It got very bright at this moment. So it's traveling like this. And over here we can see the elements uh, and minerals that were detected. That's that's pretty exciting. Look, if spectroscopy is a niche, then what we're, what we're doing on this slide is a niche in a niche, right? Okay, so flash spectrum, we've heard lots about the sun. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it right now, uh, except to talk about the fact that um, hydrogen, or excuse me, helium was discovered on the sun in a solar eclipse in the late 1800s. Um, that's a story for another day. Just a quick review. Doppler shift, uh, again, many of us are familiar with it, is the pitch change that things make when they're moving. For example, if a car comes racing past you or a train through a station with its whistle on or the car's horn, it goes, right? High when it's coming towards you, low when it's moving away. The same thing happens with light. So if we were expecting this triplet here to be right there, a spectrum triplet, and instead, we saw it over to the side like that, to the right, we'd know that that object was moving away from us and it was red shifted. And of course, on the other side, if it was blue shifted, we'd know it was coming towards us. Let's look at a cool example that we can use spectra in this way to understand something about uh, a supernova. Now, you know, there's different types of supernovae and this example I'm gonna do in seven seconds. Two stars are circling each other, one dumps gas on the other, and it explodes. Five seconds. That's not so bad. So, and that explosion destroys the star that's exploding. Here's one right there in a galaxy. And there is an example of one of these. This is not the one in M101, one that's more local here. But notice that it sort of looks like a sphere. It looks like you can sort of see through it that it's thinner or, you know, in the center or something. It certainly has some shape, it seems. So David Strange captured the spectrum of this. And you can see on the lower left there on a C9 in less than 15 minutes of integration time. So yeah, there was a little bit of work involved. And there is the profile graph in my software. And there's a dip right there. And that dip is the fingerprint for a supernova. Now, this next slide is not going to be on the quiz at the end of my talk. But this next slide shows all sorts of different supernova types, right? The one we're looking at, a type 2, A, B, or there's no A, but it, and so forth. Notice that the type 1A has a big dip right around just above 6,000. That's what we're seeing down here. And this is the way the professionals classify supernovae. So what can we do with that data? Well, we can figure out how fast the shell of that supernova is coming towards us. Check this out. First thing we do is we note where that dip is in the software and we make a note of it, right? Then we look up you know, from Bunsen's data or other people, where would we find that dip if we were burning something locally that wasn't moving, like beach sand? Those two numbers are different, right? So the difference between those two numbers, <laughs> I don't know why I'm having so much trouble finding the cursor tonight. The difference between those two is because the shell of that supernova is coming towards us, right? So there's Doppler shift. I listen, I didn't know the Doppler shift formula, but Wikipedia is our friend, right? So we looked it up, what, one multiplication, uh, one division, and uh, one subtraction. You plug those numbers in, 
And wow, the shell of that supernova is coming towards us at 22 million miles per hour on a backyard telescope. We measured that. Isn't that astonishing? So some of you may recognize Adam Rees, who won his Nobel Prize. He and his team, just before the turn of the century, studied and published about the accelerating cosmological expansion. What stars do you think he used as standard candles? Type 1A supernova. So now, yeah, these guys are giants and we're able to tiptoe in their huge footsteps and do some of the kinds of things they do. Uh, you know, what, this is 200 bucks, his telescope. How much were his instruments? You know, how many tens or hundreds of millions of dollars? So bang for our buck, we're doing pretty well. It is fun to, um, to duplicate some of the research that's been done. Um, Adam Reese actually commented on a publication that I did uh, about 12 years ago, and, and if we have time, we'll come back to that. So what about the spectrum of a black hole? Well, of course, the black hole isn't emitting light, but all that material that's circulating, spinning in and spiraling in is moving so fast it heats up, it emits light. And of course, everybody knows exactly where C3273 is in that image, right? I certainly didn't. David, David Hayworth down in Portland did, there it is. And there's its spectrum. Those two arrows on the right are pointing to two dots of light. Let's zoom in on it. There they are. Okay, so what are those? Emission lines, okay. There's the spectrum, the profile graph. So what are those peaks? Well, this guy, Martin Schmidt, now I looked before the meeting started, I didn't see anybody on, younger than 30 years old that I could spot in there. But when there are younger people in the audience, and maybe they're here too, I never call them and I'm embarrass them or anything. But I, I like to point out that this guy isn't much older than a teenager. He was in his mid twenties. And he looked at these peaks and like any researcher, and I know this from an interview that he did that there's a transcript of on our site and it's a fascinating interview because he had the same imposter's complex that I mentioned earlier. What he discovered was, the first thing he did, he said, well, let's rule out that these are hydrogen lines. He looked at the hydrogen bomber lines. I meant to ask you to remember this screen from my software, but there are the bomber lines for hydrogen. There's the robin egg blue line right there that we saw. So these lines don't line up with the data, do they? I don't see any matches there, even if I was to draw the lines vertically. So he concluded, he said, well, whatever those peaks are, they aren't hydrogen. He worked and worked, and he eventually discovered that they were hydrogen, massively redshifted. And that redshift is because of the cosmological expansion between us and this quasar. We calculated pretty closely with the data like this how far away it was, 2 billion light years. It's amazing, isn't it? So that this light, right, this light with these couple of, you know, fuzzy dots could come across such great time and distance and still have information on it that we can tease out, it, not on, on it, it is it, right? How does that happen? Well, I wish other things in the universe aged that well. Here's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. Uh, he's, uh, he's since deceased. And um, I'm just, you know, people say, that, you know, I'm throwing him under the bus here, but really I'm just jealous of him. He's got a full head of hair. <laughs> I, I wasn't so lucky. So that's Martin Schmidt's data. Now here's Phil's data. Same data, same object. And what he did, well, let's just look at the objects over here. So there's the quasar. And you can notice that these don't line up, right? The beginning of the red is to the left of the red beginning here. It's a little harder to see here, um, but again, we would expect hydrogen beta to be at 4861. That's that robin egg blue. It's really cool actually, uh, Phil, that you did this with a color camera. I've never seen that done before. That's quite an accomplishment. And we didn't find it there. We found it way over here. So now again, we are walking in the footsteps of giants. It's a really remarkable that we can do this thing and measure across such great distances. And it's a, of course, it's a testimony to, to just uh, human ingenuity and our drive to learn as, as a species, right? As, as a culture, always be learning. 
So, so far, and we're gonna finish up with a couple quick examples when we be done. So far, that dip is about as high a resolution as we could get. That's the hydrogen beta line over here. Let's see, that one. What if we wanted to look into detail on that dip? That's when we have to step up to those slit devices. There's Vega and there's the moon. The moon isn't really moving towards or away from us very much, but notice there is some Doppler shift that went on here. But to do this kind of high resolution, as I said, requires a higher end device. So last uh, example coming up here, and I've got actually a demonstration tool, this thing. So if this was a star spinning very fast, that would mean that this edge is coming towards you fast and this edge is moving away from you. So you would get blue shift from the light coming from the approaching edge and red shift from the light moving away. And if you looked at the hydrogen alpha absorption feature here and compared it to Vega, you would see that it's much broader, right? And that's how we can study how fast stars are rotating just by studying the shape of that absorption feature. It's, it's pretty amazing. So real quickly here, just zoom through a couple of slides. How do you get started? Uh, I've mentioned the star analyzer already. Uh, a camera, you need almost any type of camera. I should have the words color and mono, either one. I just can't believe I've given all these presentations. Don't actually show that visually here. You need some sort of data reduction software. That's my software that I showed you earlier. If I was a better salesman and marketer, I would have said it's name a handful of times. R in the R spec stands for real time uh, because whether it's a video or whether it's a static single shot, fits image, cooled, stacked, whatever, you get the immediate spectrum. So there's no steep learning curve, as I mentioned. You may need some adapters. Uh, that's because... Um, Let's go like that. This distance, while not critical, we need to determine how far to put the grating away from the sensor. Usually it's just screwed onto those beats and on we go. Okay, there's tons of good books out there. Um, I wanted to just show you that on my site are some books that are written up. Uh, you know, I, I feature this one here because it's a pretty cool one in my talk. But recently, as I've begun to emphasize more about learning, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to point out these two books by Patrick Moore, a part of the Patrick Moore series. These two books, you know, those Patrick Moore series, they're just those, you know, little tiny paperbacky things, always, always accessible. And uh, really, that's where I got most of my knowledge, from just reading one of those. There's no math or anything involved. It's, it's just, you know, Give me, give me the good so that I can have some fun with my grading. So that um, Walker's Atlas I mentioned to you has lots of examples like this where he points things out and he explains why we're seeing things. So it's sort of uh, aimed at us. It's an amateur book. It doesn't, again, no math. It's not for grad students or undergraduates. Uh, we've got a great forum online that, uh, you know, makes it a lot easier to get questions answered. And I spend a lot of time during the day responding to emails, making screen recordings, using data people send me. I get a great deal of pleasure out of that, and I've got the time to do it, which is terrific. Um, about five, six, seven years ago, I taught a workshop to the AVSO, uh, about 100 of them, at the SAS conference, and it was recorded. And the sample data and that recording on YouTube are available. So tomorrow morning, you could download the software, which is free for 30 days, and go through Vega Spectrum and get the, the lay of the land, even if you never did anything else with it. So there's opportunities for pro-am collaboration. Uh, everybody in this list of authors here, except Bob Stencil at the bottom. God, Bob Stencil at the bottom is the only professional. Uh, so that God was, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'll have to make that dot bigger or something. Um, or maybe sit further back from the from the monitor. Okay, so there are opportunities, but to be honest, there are not as many as we might like. The, the AVSO does have their AV spec database where amateurs can contribute, and there's also other people or other data sets. Uh, the, um, uh, the British uh, database, the British Astronomy Club, whose name I can't remember right now, they've got a, a spectra database, so there are opportunities to contribute. So. This is where we started, and this is where we're going to finish up in the HR diagram. Again, as we study the stars and use our own data, uh, there's a commitment that we have because it's our own data, 
And by understanding the stars in light of the HR diagram, my personal experience and thousands of other people. And I, the reason that, you know, I say thousands and it is literally thousands. But when I first started doing this in like 2010 and I went to Neef, I just felt like people were looking at me like, you know, this guy's the Pied Piper. <laughs> you know, you can't do this. Nobody had heard of this stuff. So um, I got interviewed uh, by Sky and Telescope uh, by Dennis DeChico while I was there. And that gave me a little more credibility. Uh, it still astonishes people what's possible. Me too. Even now I was out, you know, and I mentioned schools a little while ago. I was out with a high school uh, just up, up the street, about 10 minute drive from here. Uh, there's a, a teacher there who has a telescope and we went out and we're capturing Spectre with a couple students. And uh, it's just as every bit as exciting for me uh, the hundredth time as it is the first time. So uh, I hope that again, um, you've seen this progression that I've shown you in terms of how we learned about this and the science behind all of the understanding that we have of the stars. I'd like to thank you all for uh, maybe smiling at my jokes. I couldn't see because the lights were off. But uh, again, I'll be here until you uh, throw me off the stage. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. So what questions? Phil threatened me. He said he had a couple of questions. We may make it more technical we want to, but uh, are you, is your mic on? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Turn on the light and then you can stand up to so where they could, where he could see it. Front and center. Like, I don't know. Oh, there we go. God, it is a bunch of gray hairs. Look at that. Just look at the camera. <laughs> All right, get a little more to the left. Oh, he's under 30. There you go. Oh, there we go. Good. Thank God, man. The yeah. future, the future is with you. What's up, Phil? Hi. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the um uh, I'm I'm gonna draw a blank here. Let me grab my notes. Uh just oh. about um, <laughs> dispersion. Dispersion. Yes. Um sometimes I get a different number. Uh using the same setup. Is that focus or? That's a good question. It could be focus. What are you saying? The, this word dispersion is how spread out the spectrum is, how quickly it spreads out. It could be if you're screwing your grading on that you don't get it to the exact spot that you had it before. Is that possible? Do you, uh, do you dismount it? I pretty much have that. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and also this is a relatively low resolution device, so the, it might be focusing. Send me some samples, and, and I'll take a look at them here and, and give you some comments, Phil. Okay, yeah. Um, my other question um, was, uh, let me pass, and I'll uh, think about it here. Okay, that's great. Listen, yeah. while we're talking, you'll be able to see me. No, you can sit down, Phil. Thank you. You know, I, I take these talks seriously. Um, and this is the first talk, really, it's the Fort Worth Club that, that gets the benefit of this. Most of us have cameras that are mounted on top of our monitors, which means I'm talking to you. You know, you're not really seeing me. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but I actually duct taped a, a piece of plexiglass to my monitor. And so the camera is now right in the middle of my monitor. So some of you may have noticed there were a couple screens where I was like leaning to the side to look past the camera and see what it was hiding. But I think in the future, we're going to see monitors uh, for laptops. I don't know how they'll do it. It has to be like a one-way mirror. You don't want to screw up the display with a hole in it for a camera, even a pinhole. But anyway, I thought I'd show you that. What other questions do people have? Oh, great. Um, is it? Worthwhile to uh, go to a modified color camera. Speaking of, you know, DSLs, uh, a modified camera is that better? Yeah, the modified camera. Um, when you say modified, you mean remove the red filter or remove the Bayer filter? Uh, I think it's for hydrogen alpha. So yeah, so it's be removing the red filter. Yeah, you'll get a little further into the red end with it. But as you've probably seen on, for example, on your quasar fill most of the data we're looking at is pretty much mid-range. It's not like way off to the right in the red. So it's probably not worth the work to do that. It's a good question though. Uh, you might ask on our forum too, because the people there know lots more than I do about it. Good. Now, sir, your question. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for taking time to speak this tonight. It was okay. 
very interesting for all of us. Uh, Thank you. But I, oh, I'm too close. Okay. The uh, I watched uh, one of your presentations on YouTube today, and you showed a slide about Alberio. Oh yes, I did. I I think that was pretty fascinating. I don't, I don't know if you could pull that up and show show this to wow. our group, but uh, I think they find it to be very interesting. Uh, I will try. If you can. Um, yeah, because it's, um, I'm actually surprised I can't just lay my hands on it. Thank you for asking. There it is. Okay, I'm going to share my screen one thing at a time. This is like a 30 second video. So, you know, not to worry. There it is. Uh, I'm going to launch the video and bring it over to here. Okay, so what do we have here? And that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because. The reason I started all this was I wanted to make this video. I wanted to see the temperature difference between Albireo A and B spectroscopically. So here are the two stars. Now, currently, I've got the software set up, you know, with the orange capture box to image or to capture the data of that, that star, which is Albireo B. Now, it's a really hot star, Wikipedia told me. But look at this spectrum over here. Notice that there's much more light over here in the blue than there is in the cooler red. That's like a Planck curve, if you're familiar with that. So now I'm going to start this video. This is real time under the stars. I'm, it's a recording, of course. But in about five seconds, you'll see me move those orange lines. There they go. And now we're looking at the data from Albireo A. And look how different the shape of that spectrum is. There's more energy and intensity in the red end than there is in the blue end. So we can actually see something about the temperature of stars with a grading. And I just, I, I'm really glad you asked that because it is, it's a pretty exciting result. The interesting thing is that professionals don't do it this way. Professionals don't look at the shape of that curve to know whether it's a hot or cool star. They actually use the existence of dips and absorption and emission features. But thanks for asking me to show that. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful slide to show. Uh, I'm proud of it uh, because it shows the kind of science that we all can do. So I thought of the one other thing I mentioned, I'd say I've, I've maybe got a minute or two left here. Um, and that is I mentioned that Adam Reese commented on some of my work. That's sort of name dropping, right? He's a Nobel Prize winner. It's like my mentioning Neil deGrasse Tyson earlier. So with Adam Reese, the story is in 2010, I submitted that quasar spectrum like Phil's to the magazine and the editor in chief, Bob Noye at that time, he looked at my write-up and because in my write-up in my paper, I said, this is Doppler shift. That's why they don't appear where you expect them to appear. And so Bob knew the answer to this question, but he sent it off to Adam Reese who would win the Nobel prize about six months later. And he said, Adam, he must have known him. Adam, Tom's calling this Doppler shift because those lines are moved. Is that Doppler shift? And Adam replied with a very gracious letter. And he said, no. He said, we don't call it Doppler shift. Get this, because nothing's moving. So there's cosmological expansion going on, but nothing's moving. I love the precision of language and the understanding that that reveals. In that, yes, uh, you know, there is this cosmological expansion, but what, what's, is anything moving? Because they aren't really moving. It, I mean, it's a subtle difference, but I love the fact that I got the mention of Nobel Prize winner's name. So that's, that's my story. Um, and the Neil deGrasse story, I'll tell you just to keep you amused for another moment, if I'm lucky. And that is, you know, I mentioned how Neil deGrasse Tyson told me. And, you know, my goal there, not really, but it wouldn't hurt if you said, oh, Tom hangs out with Tyson. Pretty cool. Well, not exactly. On three separate occasions, I stood out in the rain outside the Paramount Theater here in Seattle, waiting for him to come out at about midnight because he does this signing and photograph thing, meet and greet. So the first year I had, I actually had this quasar spectrum and people are lined up you know, fawning over him. There are about 30 of us on the sidewalk and he's signing programs and people are telling him which Cosmos series he liked, uh, they liked. And he's very gracious. 
I get up there and I go, you know, Dr. Tyson, you know, we're capturing the specter of quasars here with high school kids. And he, it was like, I threw a switch. He was no longer a celebrity. He was now a scientist. And he started asking questions about it. You know, it was funny. One of the questions was, what are you packing? What? What? I said, I beg your pardon? He was asking me what the aperture was of our telescopes. But so then we were done talking. <laughs> That's how he asked. So um, when it was, you know, I'd sort of used up my time. I, I had this folder with a couple of samples that I'd shown him and I went to leave and he, and he said, could I have that folder? And I'm going, ka-ching, you know, here we go. <laughs> Nothing. So the second year, that's like two years later, same thing in the rain, waiting for the king to come out, right? Feeling like a pauper on the sidewalk, waiting for him to flip me a coin. That's how it felt, which is why I won't do this again. Three is enough. And I had a poster, my new periodic table, which I don't have on the wall, although I'm gesturing as if I do. And I had it out at arm's length, hanging over the Jersey barrier, keeping us from him. He was beat. He was tired. He was walking to his limousine. The dozen of us there were saying, hey, Neil, come over and talk. He said, no, you know, he, he was tired. So finally, he said, OK, he sort of started walking over like this, you know, tired. And he looked up at the poster and he went, oh, my, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Why hasn't anybody thought of that before? Now I'm really going to ching. So he paused a beat and he said, can I have one? My wife, in her wisdom, had sent me with a poster tube with the poster in it. It had my business card with special non-marring tape. And uh, he went off with it. Now I'm sure I'm going to get a thank you note. Nothing. Bupkis. So, and then the third time I saw him was a couple of years ago. And this is, I'm not saying that he needed to be any different. I mean, he's a celebrity. He has people pulling at him all the time. And it felt a little, not dirty, but I, I just felt like I was, old, I was sort of there with my hand out. Listen, he's got 13 million Twitter followers. If he was to tweet out that poster, it's no longer my wife and me sitting in front of the TV, stuffing a few posters into tubes. It becomes a high school kid in the garage stuffing tubes for weeks at a time. But it didn't happen. He's a generous, gracious guy. He's every bit as nice and, and just comfortable with himself as uh, you've seen him in uh, various productions on TVs and stuff. Anyway, end of my stories. Uh, are there any other questions before I put you all asleep? Yes, there is. Come on up. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Good. I'm really kind of shocked that nobody has asked this. Uh -oh. Outreach is a huge part of the Fort Wayne Astronomy Society. And my question is, do you have some sort of a, a canned outline on how you incorporate VSpec with a, with a real-time capture so that you can actually do some outreach and have some structure around the uh, around the presentation of the material and all that. <laughs> I wish I did. Sounds like you, you've been you've been out without curriculum and had to develop your own on occasion. I don't. Yes. Um, I with the um, in terms of there's there's two questions there. How do I learn to do this, and then how do I learn to present it? And I can I'm I'm proud of that learning how to do it because it's easy to do. And in the software is a getting started manual that walks through the various things to do. I imagine Phil would pick up the ball on that and, and run with it over the oh, I, I, I'm, I'm I'm right there. there. I'm right there with you imagining it, yeah. Phil. Go for it. Yeah. So it's it's pretty easy. And I'll tell you just um really briefly, let me just share my screen. This will be uh the last screen share. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for asking. Um so when you're here looking at a spectrum and you can yell if you can't see my screen, you can I see. And you have this little reference library up and you've got those lines visible, what the chemistry teachers want to see is this. That's the energy transition diagram with the electrons jumping between shells. This is for the bomber series. This is right out of their textbooks. And my software didn't have this originally. And I was at a, a chemistry conference and some teachers at Bill Gates' former high school came by. And they suggested this. Actually, they just said, put it up there. And I said, you want to turn my software into a photo viewer or a PDF viewer? Let's go one further. And when you click on these transitions, the software will put up the line on the graph where it occurs. So this is what chemistry teachers want. Uh, they, typically, what we find is the chemistry teacher is going to introduce 
spectroscopy and energy levels. And what you do is then you demonstrate it and you tie it back to what they've taught with this. Anyway, listen, all I, I really appreciate it. Thank goodness it's not the winter or in, in snowing there, or you'd all be snowed in. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And thanks for the outreach you do. It's the way we all give back. Uh, you're welcome, Matthew. Uh, thank you. And um, have a great evening, everybody. Oh, and, and again, you can find me on the web. I love answering questions. Don't hesitate to ask. Thank you for letting me go first before your business meeting and, and what's up tonight and observing reports and stuff. As you can imagine, I've sat through quite a few of those over the years, and it just makes things a little faster for me if I don't do it again. I'm always fascinated to hear them. But tonight, I think dinner's just about on the table, so I'm going to take off. Thank you all again. And thanks for the applause. So anyway, so this is uh, M3, I think. Yeah, it's M3. So it says on the bottom of my screen. And uh, I matched it up with some stars using uh, one of my planetarium programs just to, just to prove that it actually works out and uh, try to see what the lower magnitude, lowest magnitude was. Mm -hmm. I kind of like the idea that the stars are mostly round. But that I take as a as a compliment both to the to the uh, to the mount and uh, the fact that I did my polar alignment with SharpCap. And SharpCap is the uh, is the capture software, and I put to good use the uh, the uh, automatic stacking feature that it has. So I think it may have done a little bit of derotation, but it actually looks pretty decent. And uh, I think this is a this is about a stack of maybe ten uh, twenty second exposures. I think. Um, I also went to the trouble of uh, uh, subtracting dark frames, uh, and I did a, a flat field on it. And there is a noticeable difference uh, when you push it real hard. You can see all the all the dust motes and and other things that are on there. So I found the flat field. Uh, that's your refractor. refractor. Yeah. yeah, that's my AP refractor. This, this shot here. Yes. And what's the F number on that? Six. Okay. So it's not a huge field. But I like that. That was a that was a very pleasant like approval there. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's see. So this one I think is M53. No, is that M53? Could it be? Yes, that's M53 next. So it says so. And with again, dark and flats. Uh, I, I see when I don't didn't apply the flats when I pushed it, uh, there were there actually you could see. What looked to be shadows or, or holes in the in the image, and the in the flat field kind of took that away. Now, again, this is about the same on the on the exposure front. You know, 10, 10 stacks of maybe twenty seconds. Nice round stars again. I think this is kind of interesting. Kind of uh, Mizar and Elcor. This was like from last month, just a star field. But it's interesting that uh, uh, Mizar is the central star here, and there is. Uh, what you can see are like two companions. This is uh, Mizar, Mizar B down here. So this is a this is a binary combination. But Mizar and Alcor are also uh, binaries, so they're gravitationally locked. And uh, the little bit of um, Wikipedia research I did uh, had the uh, had the, the rotational period of uh, Alcor around Mizar is a, at about three quarters of a million years. Kind of makes you wonder if they're actually gravitationally uh, constrained. Uh, and uh, Mizar B uh, turns out to be just about 380 uh, astronomical units, so they're relatively close. And this this is a little bit uh, of star bloat here. If I really backed it down, you can actually get a good separation on it. So I thought that was kind of nice. And this uh, kind of gives you the that's kind of gives you the the statistics uh, behind it. But in addition to uh, Mizar and Alcor and, and uh, Mizar B, so you got three stars, but it turns out that each of these three are also spectroscopic uh, binaries. So there's actually six stars uh, that, are, that are in this configuration. You just can't see them uh, visually. Spectroscopically, um, yeah, we should be able to detect them. And I'm afraid what Tom was talking about in terms of doing line measurements, uh, you'd have to actually go to line measurements to figure out you know that there is a companion here. There, it makes changes in the in the the width of those lines that he was pointing out. So mm -hmm. I think that might be it. Oh yeah, uh, I was going after uh, the Galaxy uh, NGC thirty three ninety five, uh, and 
So the AP is a very nice refractor, but the mount, I don't have encoders on it. Um, and so I kind of handicapped in that uh, all I have are the, uh, are the analog setting circles that are there. Uh, and with those, I was, I was using uh, the finder scope to generate star fields so that I could feed my plate solver program. And uh, I underestimated the, uh, overestimated the size of the, uh, of the image uh, of the camera. And I didn't come anywhere close uh, to actually getting the galaxy that I wanted, but it's a very nice star field. But there is there is a galaxy down here, and this is only I don't know twelfth or thirteenth magnitude galaxy. It would have been very impressive to catch the three galaxies that I was actually aiming for. And it just goes to show once again that you really, really, really have to trust your plate solver program. You got to get the, the the differences in the uh, in the position. And what the plate solver is telling you down to as close to zero as you can, at least within a few minutes. And unfortunately, I learned a lesson. You have to uh, you have to get there. So this is the only one I got, a miss, but uh, you know, education at a high price. Oh, and uh, this was also flat fielded. And you see these these spots here. These are the features that the flat field takes out oh yeah so there's some dust on the uh, on the diagonal i just put the camera on top of the uh, the diagonal uh and it turns out the diagonal is how we have so it took them out and i was very happy about that uh, so i think that's that's definitely it oh here's the uh, here's the field of view <laughs> of the camera right and you could this is the this is the target right here so close. I mean, another move, you know, another move, and I would have been there. But the but the night was so was so poor, yeah. and I had dew building up on the on the uh, the optics of the of the finder. I didn't have my dew heaters put on there, and I had a lot of new equipment that I was just trying out. So the tube was wet. the The lens of the finder was wet. Uh, it was getting close to. Uh, it was after one thirty a.m. I was beat and really wanting to go to bed more than I wanted to do the move, but that's where I was, mm -hmm. and that's about how close I was. So here's my, here's the one that I did find. Yeah, thirty four twenty four. That's cool. So there you go, and I believe that's quite enough of that. <laughs>